looking, the copies of the pleadings are on the table, our extensive exhibit list are, um, is, is there as well, and um, some demonstratives for you of some charts and timelines of the corruption. I hope everyone will, will uh, pick it up and take a look, and I'm answering any questions that you have. Um, my name is Joshua Tepfer. That's T-E-P-F-E-R, and I'm um, an attorney with the Exoneration Project at the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, I'm joined by a number of people here to go through, but um, there are um, eight individuals who are involved as petitioners, in this case seven petitioners, and then Elian Thomas, who is the son of Philip Thomas. Philip got in a serious car accident this morning, unfortunately, so he's hospitalized, but his son is here. And, and Eileen's going to talk briefly. Um, Jamar Lewis, one of our petitioners, will also speak very briefly as well um, regarding our petition. Of course, Ben Baker and Clarissa Glenn are up here as well, hiding in the background there. Um, these individuals that are standing before you represent just some of the victims that were affected by the Chicago tactical team led by Sergeant Ronald Watts over a decade of terror in the south side Ida B. Wells housing project. I'm gonna ask them to move for a second. But over on that table, Clarissa, can you just move for a second, is the pile of evidence that proves exactly what I just said, that these are victims. What is unique about this case and what we're doing here is that generally when you have allegations of this type of misconduct, it is the words of individuals like the eight here, the 15 petitioners, or the 10 here, and the 15 petitioners in this case, versus the police officers and law enforcement who denies it, and it's a word against them. What's extraordinary about this case is there is no dispute. There is no question that there was an extraordinary amount of police corruption. What we have here, what you hear all the time in, in the legal system is, is there's overwhelming evidence of something. Overwhelming does not do its justice here. It's indisputable evidence. That, I don't know what we want to call it, 10 inch thick of documents, 10 inches thick of documents, is overwhelmingly filled with law enforcement documents, FBI investigation documents, investigation documents from the Chicago Police Department, the Internal Affairs Division. It's filled with statements from US attorneys. It's filled with, um, ultimately filled with complaints of these types of people, citizens, all saying what exactly what I told you, that there was a decade long corrupt police unit running rampant. These men are the victims of this corruption. So really what we're here to talk about is what do we do about it? What do we do about now that we know that this corruption was running rampant for a decade? And the answer to that question really comes on page one of my petition right there, the very first page. The answer comes from a statement from Judge Michael Tooman. Judge Michael Tooman is the one who presided over Ben and Clarissa's case. At the time, Judge Tooman found both of them guilty. Ben testified, Clarissa made statements, everyone made those statements of exactly what happened to them. That they too were victims of a corrupt police crew, Sergeant Ronald Watts, who planted evidence on them. Judge Tooman didn't believe him. Just like all the people standing up here, just like the 60, 70, if not more examples of citizen complaints that are in that petition that we filed, just like Lionel White, William Carter, Bruce Powell, and all the eight convictions that have already been vacated over the last two years based on this exact same evidence, nobody believed any of them. Nobody believed them at the time. And Ben suffered for it. Ben spent 10 years in prison. Clarissa suffered from the conviction. And all these people standing up here suffered in the same exact way. But Judge Tooman did have the forethought to say, what happens? What happens if I got it wrong? What happens if 
if it is true, this seemingly outlandish story of police corruption, something out of a movie, out of training day, that's what these guys keep repeating to me, it was like training day, who's seen that? If that happens to be true, what are we going to do? And I'm going to read a quote to you from Michael, Judge Michael Tooman that is, again, on page one of our petition, and he anticipated what should be done if it happens. And he said this directly to Ben and Clarissa on the record in court in September of 2006. Quote, I can't conceive of a situation where if things should develop down the line, where it turns out that your suspicions are correct, and that Sergeant Ronald Watts is tagged at some point, and that there, is, that there is a judge in this building, I can't conceive that the state would object to vacating pleas and even convictions. It just would not be right to allow convictions if they were based upon outlier police. So what we're asking today is for that promise to be kept for these 15 petitioners. It is truly indisputable that these were, quote, outlaw police. Ronald Watts, by any definition of the term, has been tagged. There are piles upon piles of documents to prove it. Let's keep our promise to these men. Let's vacate these 15 convictions, and let's start the process of healing the damage that was inflicted on this community by these corrupt officers. So I'm going to ask um, Eileen Thomas to say a word. I am happy to answer any questions that you have, and then I'm going to ask Jamar to say a brief word. Hi, my name is Elion Thomas. That's A L E O N T H O M A S. I'm the proud son of Philip Thomas. I just want the world to know that he was treated wrong, uh, unfair, unjust. Um, our family is saddened by this, and so is he. We would like the world also to know that we stand with my father, and we stand for him and with him again. Thank you. Thank you. Philip, of course, represented himself at a jury trial where he repeatedly questioned the police officers who were testifying against them, asking them, you did frame me, didn't you? You did beat me, didn't you? Arguing to the jury by himself, take, representing himself because he knew these are the public defenders, the attorneys would tell all of these individuals, you can't raise this, no one's going to believe you. But Philip Thomas had the bravery to stand up and say exactly what happened to him. Of course, he wasn't believed. Turns out he was telling the truth. Jamar, can you say a brief word? Jamal Lewis and uh, I Mr. Actually, Lewis, would you spell your first J A M A R L E W I S. I testified on this situation maybe nine, ten years ago, and I'm just glad that somebody finally, you know, listening to the situation, believing me or whatever. Thank you, Jamar. And Jamar's absolutely right. Jamar took a bench trial, testified at that bench trial exactly what happened to them. And so many of these individuals file complaints, tried to tell people were not believed and oftentimes retaliated against exactly because they told the truth and no one would believe them. Was so, there someone here who, had, who actually was retaliated against as a result of, of having an encounter and tried to tell police or tried to file a complaint? Was there someone who did that? Leonard did. Leonard, Leonard. Leonard Gibson, Ben Baker, Clarissa Leonard, Glenn. Leonard, what's your first and last name? Leonard Gibson. Okay, spell, spell that for me. L-E-O-N-N-A-R-D, okay. Gibson, G-I-P-S-O-N. And what, what was your situation? Uh, my first encounter with him is uh, he told me that if I if I ever catch you, I'm gonna plant something on you. And the first time he, he planted something on me, the second time I, I bonded out, I came home, I put OPS on him, he never heard back from OPS, and three months later he put another case on me. What are the results of that, the, the, the third case? I have a third case with him as well. Okay. I came home from the penitentiary, I did two and a half years, came home and he put another case on me in 2008. And when you say he, was this Watts? Watts, yes. Okay, and Leonard, would you, would you explain, when, a lot of people won't understand when you say put a case on you, did they actually plant drugs? He planned exactly? drug, plan drugs on me. And then his officers, uh, the whole crew arrested you, how many officers were involved? It was maybe about six to eight of them on his team. And, and Leonard, just so I'm clear, so what was, Explain to me what that encounter was like. So you're walking home or back to your apartment and you're walking down the street and you encounter the sergeant. What, is he, it, what does he say? One time I was coming, I was actually coming out the building and I was on my way to my car and he pulled me back in the building. He said, whatever I find in this building is going on you. And he went around the corner, he came back, he put me in handcuffs and walked me out the building. 
And the reason that he was doing that was what? He I wouldn't pay him. Okay. He, wanted he wanted me to pay him. How much? He wanted, it was different amounts every time. Maybe 5000 10000 15000 And we have a number of people who couldn't be here. Lee Rainey is an example of someone who can't be here today because they're working. Um, uh, and Lee Rainey filed a complaint just like, just like Leonard. And same thing happened, retaliated against, threatened. Uh, a man named Taurus Smith was a 17-year-old kid, uh, was uh, arrested falsely by Watts and his crew, uh, came out two days out of, in county jail, told his mom, and his mom immediately took him to the IIT building and said, we're going to file a complaint. He filed a complaint, walked out next day. The next day, Sergeant Ronald Watts and two of his crew members came up to him threatened him to plant a gun on him, told him this is a big boy game and you better shut your mouth. So we have a broken, broken police disciplinary system that is very much to blame for this whole process. Josh, could we, could we hear from Jamar again real quickly? Sure, Jamar's uh, uh, reluctant, but... Uh, uh, Jamar, I wonder if you would, would you just tell, tell us what, what did they do to you, what did they say to you, and then what happened? Could I step a little closer to the mic? I really, I really don't want to talk on the camera, honestly, man. It's, it's, I went to trial on the whole situation, everything in the files, and it's, you know, no one ever believed in the whole situation. It's just coming out now. The man been dirty for years, so. But, and, and let me address My situation. But just let's take it where you put it back on. Talk about how, now that this is all coming out, tell me about how you feel vindicated, how, because you had to feel horrible. I'm, I'm still not vindicated because it's still on my background. I still got situations trying to get jobs, so vindication is, not the case yet. I'm just glad that it's even being talked about because nothing's been done yet. Okay. And, and let me address that. I mean, one thing that has gone unsaid with all this is the extraordinary amount of courage these men have shown. Unbelievable men. Being here right now, courageous. Jamar getting up here, me begging him to talk to you because you know how what happened when they were trying to expose this? I already told you. They were retaliating against. They were beaten and they were planted more evidence on and planted, framed yet again. And those officers, those very same officers who were part of Watts' crew, are very much alive and serving our streets of Chicago today. And Leonard Gibson, for example, in his affidavit, took a picture of these officers continuing to harass him. Robert Gonzalez continuing to harass him as he's trying to go around and live his life. And that picture is in our affidavit. Of, um, so being up here today, Exposing themselves to this risk once again is extraordinary. It should be extraordinary power, extraordinarily powerful to everyone here. And uh, if there's any reluctance to tell that story, I, it is so easily explained. And I just personally speaking, I could not be more privileged and lucky to be able to represent these individuals. And um, and it's a true privilege in my Gosh, career. I haven't read the complaint yet, but uh, you're seeking to have the convictions vacated. Beyond that, are you seeking civil remedies, uh, money damages? Does that come later once they're vacated? These people want their convictions dismissed. They want their convictions vacated and the charges dismissed. Uh, you know, they have had to live with these felony drug convictions. And let's be very clear, you're talking about drug convictions. Lots of times people like me are standing up here and we're exonerating someone after 20 years in prison for a murder case. First of all, let's be very clear, these officers were planning enormous amounts of drugs, guns, and other contraband on these people. These were not, um, not uh, misdemeanor charges. These are class X, very, very serious drug charges that were mandatory prison sentences for many times that forced these people's hands in many cases to have to plead guilty to lesser offenses or, or get out of jail as quickly as they could as their cases lingered in and they sat in county jail. Um, so, secondly, though, the point is, yes, 14 out of the 15 petitioners are no longer in prison. Um, this has had an extraordinary effect on their lives. Um, you know, Leonard Gibson, you don't mind, Leonard Gibson's boss is here. Um, he, wa he, he came to me, and on behalf of Leonard at times, begging me, knowing how it affected Mr. Gibson. and. Um, He's a real hero. So if you people take ch chances like this on people who have these serious felony convictions on their record, trying to get a job, 
trying to find housing. It's a constant, constant struggle. So the remedy here is to try to fix that. Get these convictions dismissed and let these people try to repair the damage that these wrongful convictions have had on them. Josh, the Cook County um, State Attorney cooperating with you, or what, what's that status? Are they looking with you in terms of going to these particular cases and saying, okay, fine, we're saying some issues here? Or, you know. You're going to have to ask them. I haven't heard from them since I filed the petition. Josh, well, could, you, could you address the police department? Um, since this goes back so far, since they were investigating these officers themselves, you have that pile of stuff from the FBI, from the U.S. Attorney, and others. And yet, you have so many of these officers still on the force. What, is, what, what would you call on the Chicago Police Department to do within its own ranks? Stop covering up misconduct. Uh, this is. Uh, but, if, but with reference to the officers who are still working. In reference to officers who are still working, the credibility has been deteriorated of these officers to the point of destruction. I mean, this isn't just me saying it. This is. Ben Baker and uh, Clarissa Glenn and Lionel White and William Carter and Bruce Powell, who have had their convictions overturned on the exact basis that these were corrupt officers who planted evidence on them. And Sergeant Watts is not the only one who did that. Three other officers beyond Sergeant Watts testified against Ben Baker. There's now been judicial findings state's attorney findings that those officers committed perjury, that those officers falsified police reports, and those officers planted a class X amount of drugs on those individuals. There is no dispute. They were a part and parcel of the day-to-day -day operation of corruption that was going on the streets for 10, days, for 10 years. And to think that those same officers that there is no dispute in those five cases, those eight cases actually, eight convictions, um, are still out on the street making arrests, being promoted to sergeant, um, should trouble all, everyone who's listening to this press conference. So there have been five people with, excuse me, convictions that have already been vacated, correct? Correct. And 15 petitioners now. Correct. How many people over this 10 year, Well, let's be very, very clear. I have not solicited any of these people. Mm -hmm. I don't have that information. They, they have come to me. They have come to me, and I vetted their cases. We vetted their cases, Sean and I and the whole team here, and we found corroborating information to prove that what they were saying was absolutely true. That's the process we went through. As far, this is a tactical team, a special unit tactical team that worked the streets for 10 years. I have no idea how many arrests they made. I can't even begin to imagine. But um, I would not be, I have no idea how many resulted in convictions. My estimate at bare minimum is probably over 500 convictions over that, uh, over that um, 10 year period. And I mean, you're gonna sit here, the next question is, well, how do we know they're all fabricated? We don't, we don't, we can't. But you know what? The city made its bed. Letting this, ramp, this corruption run rampant for 10 years, there's no way to separate, I'm gonna mix my metaphors, but the wheat from the chow, is it? I can't remember. Chaff. chaff, there it is, thank you. There's no way, I'll, I'll give you the quote now, there's no way to separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, and the right thing to do is exactly what Judge Tooman foreshadowed us to. It's, we can't rely on outlaw police. Every single one of these cases, every single one of them, what you see in every finding, everyone that went to trial or a pre-trial motion is, this is a credibility contest. Who do we believe, the police officers or these citizens? Well, who do you believe now? Who do you believe now? Because I certainly believe these individuals, uh, these, these 15 individuals who are petitioners, eight who've had their convictions vacated, the 60 to 70 citizen complaints that we document of, the, uh, of unnamed people that we don't know. And uh, I certainly believe them in light of the law enforcement documents, the Chicago police whistleblowers, the FBI, uh, the U.S. attorney seems to believe them now too. Uh, 
Now, Benson hasn't. Ben's not going to talk today, and neither is Josh. So. Josh, what's the timing on this? You just find it. Uh, you filed it yesterday. Have you got a date yet? Yeah, we're going to be in court on September 20th at uh, 9 a.m. in front of the Chief Judge Martin. So we're going to seek to consolidate the petitions. And, and you know, my, my great hope is that uh, we get some justice and we get some justice swiftly for these people. I want to add one more thing. There is an individual who's pending in prison on this case. He's been filed. His name is Anthony McDaniels. Some of you have followed that case. Uh, Anthony McDaniels' uh, uh, case is, is being contested by the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. It relies on the Khaled Muhammad, who's been federally convicted, and the two, office, two of the officers who uh, are testified in, in Ben Baker's case and, and are, are part and parcel of this day-to-day -day corruption. Uh, he remains in prison. Obviously, I, I, I've said these people need justice, but no one, of course, needs justice more than Anthony McDaniels as he continues to rot in a, on, on a case where um, solely based on the credibility of these same you mentioned that 14 of the 15 people named in this petition are out. Who is that 15 person? Sorry. Andre McNary is um, uh, uh, serving prison on an unrelated case right now. On uh, unrelated to the case named in the petition? Correct. Okay. But 14 of the 15 are working, living, trying to go on with their lives. Um, you know, several can't be here today precisely because they're working. Mm -hmm. Might make mention, uh, one of the people who, who is not here is a man named Lionel White Jr. That, of course, is the son of Lionel White Sr., who has been exonerated, was exonerated um, in, uh, uh, I think it was December of 2015, of a case that, um, you know, Watts and Alvin Jones and other officers planted on him, and that's now been widely accepted. Uh, Lionel White Sr. filed a complaint. He was beaten for it. He filed a complaint, uh, I believe, in, against these officers. Of course, he was not believed. I will tell you, weeks, weeks after Lionel White filed his complaint against Sergeant, now Sergeant Alvin Jones, Sergeant Alvin Jones and Ronald Watts targeted Lionel White Jr. for arrest and planted evidence against him. And that's the case we're seeking to overturn for Lionel White Jr. now. So you want another example of, of the vindictiveness and the corruption? That's a prime example. Lionel White Jr. is at work today, though. So Lionel White Jr. was targeted specifically because of the complaint his father made, and that arrest that his father complained about is the one that was ultimately convicted of Ben Baker. Yeah, I can't, all I can tell you is that when Lionel White Jr. asked Sergeant Watts why, why he was doing this to him, why he was arresting him falsely and putting evidence on him, Sergeant Watts looked at him and said, take it up with Al. And three weeks before or so, roughly three weeks or so before, Lionel White Jr. filed an OPS complaint against Alvin Jones, claiming that he framed him and beat him severely, hospitalized him. We have hospital records to prove it. So I'm putting two and two together. You guys can make your own decisions on that. What I'm getting at is that complaint against Jones is the one connected to the arrest for the conviction that was ultimately vacated. That's absolutely right, okay. Megan, yes. And, uh, and I mean, what goes without saying here, the Taurus Smith story, the Lionel White Jr. story is, these officers knew exactly who and when they were being complained about. And that's not even in dispute. That's in the collective bargaining agreement of the uh, Chicago police. They always are told who complained against them. And in this case, when they were told, these corrupt officers uh, targeted them yet again. Josh, is there any new development? Is there any reason why this case is being brought now? These are all pretty old cases. Those reports, uh, all that stuff was out there. Watts was invited some time ago. Why, uh, why file this? Well, I, I, I would take issue with the idea that this stuff has been out there. The complaints, the CR complaints that have been the backbone of, that are the backbone, the citizen complaints of our uh, complaints or of our petition were not out there. They were not out there until Jamie Calvin and the team of attorneys fought and fought to get them public. And that did not happen until, what, I mean, literally no more than six months ago that the, the litigation was finally concluded and we were able to start getting this information from the Freedom of Information Act. I, I had no other way of getting it, nor did anybody else. Um, so that's one. Two, the FBI documents that are the, the, another backbone of our, of our pleading um, continue to be, for lack of a better word, covered up. 
I mean, we have, they're highly, highly redacted. We only got that from, again, a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit that forced the, the federal government's hand to at least give us some highly redacted documents to show the scope of, of this complaint. The, the sworn statements from whistleblowing police officers, Shannon Spaulding, Daniel Echevarria, Mickey Spargarin, Pete Kachonis, all, all came about in the last year or two. This is all very, very new information. And of course, Sergeant Ronald Watts and, and Officer Colette Muhammad taking the fifth, and when asked about the scope of their corruption, it all came out this year. So um, that's the evidence. Uh, the, if there's any complaint that we didn't file it within a couple months, I can't begin to tell you the enormous effort and team effort it took to put this together to get transcripts, uh, to look in court files. Uh, getting transcripts can take months from court reporters and all the offices, which we needed to corroborate that these individuals did in fact, like Jamar, testify to this case, to this corruption. Um, so uh, I don't think there's any real delay here at all. Um, these people have come to me, and I'll be clear, they're still coming to me. I mean, I put this off as long as I could, but um, you know, I'm getting calls today. I'm getting calls uh, in the last couple weeks of, of cases that we're now gonna investigate, and we're gonna continue to do the exact same process we did for these 15 men. We're gonna vet them, we're gonna see if they're corroborated, if they are, we're gonna file petitions seeking to get those convictions vacated too. So I'm sorry to tell you, you guys haven't seen the end of me. Do you expect any uh, actions taken against the officers? I expect our public officials do their job and keep their promises. We have a, a county prosecutor who ran on reform. I think this is a good place to start. Any other questions? Thank you. You're watching Hard Lens Media.